Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Toronto AI Robotics L seminar. Uh, today, we are glad to have Nolan Wagner from Georgia Tech to give a talk about MoCap Act, a multitask data set for simulated humanoid control. Nolan Wagner is a PhD candidate in robotics at the Georgia Institute of Technology, advised by Byron Boots from University of Washington and Panagiotis Tisatris. His research focuses on hierarchical reinforcement learning, safe reinforcement learning, and model predictive control, with the goal of an agent being able to interact with and learn from an environment with little to no risk of damaging itself. He was an NSF graduate research fellow from 2015 to 2020 and recipient of Best Robotic Manipulation Paper Award at ICRA 2015 and Best Student Paper Award at RSS 2019. So yeah, uh, Nolan, we're all looking forward to your talk. Please feel free to take over. Yes. Awesome. Thanks again for the invitation and thanks for the, the very nice introduction. Um, so I'm Nolan Wagner, and I'm here to present on a paper we just recently released, and hopefully you guys can make immediate use of and immediately benefit from. Um, so it's called MoCap Act, and this is a multitask data set for simulated humanoid control. Um, this is work done in collaboration with colleagues at Microsoft Research, and it will be appearing at the NeurIPS data sets and benchmarks track in a couple of months. So uh, obligatory, please check out my poster. And of course, I'll be happy to talk. If, if any of you are there, I'll be happy to talk with you even more about my work. All right, so first let's lay the groundwork for why we want to even study this problem. What, why do we want to study humanoid control to begin with? Um, so first, hopefully we're all aware, um, we as humans can perform a wide variety of behaviors just with our single uh, body. Um, we can of course walk and run, but we can also do more complicated and involved uh, behaviors like dancing and cartwheels. Um, and much, much more, too, ma too many to list on this slide. Um, and of course, we're trying to at least get humanoid robots to do some subset uh, of the things we can do, but um, I'm sure we're all aware uh, it's difficult at the moment to make this happen, uh, even in just controlled lab settings, let alone in the wild. Um, so everyone's probably seen the DARPA robotics challenge videos of all of these robots struggling to move forward and always falling over, always damaging themselves, and um, just ending up in these blooper videos. Um, and it really points to the frustration of, um, despite the fact that we can mechanically design fantastic humanoid robots at a software and algorithmic level, they still struggle to do very basic things that we as humans take for granted. Um, as a counterpart though, there have been companies and organizations like Boston Dynamics that have shown some successes in endowing uh, robots with uh, human behaviors. And as a matter of fact, it's almost like superhuman behaviors, um, being able to run and jump around, hop around, perform backflips repeatedly. Um, this is incredibly impressive stuff. Um, but in general, with humanoid robots, we're just not there yet. Uh, there is still just a huge uh, gap in uh, getting humanoid robots to competently do anything like this. Um, so I'm not proposing we try to get this working on humanoid robots right now. Instead, I think we should um, also focus on working on simulated humanoid robots. Uh, so the upside is we don't have to break robots. Um, we can work in faster than real time since we could do this in simulation, but it also offers a good test bed for studying um, algorithms for humanoid control. Um, for instance, DeepMind has released a paper on humanoid soccer and they show how they can get uh, teams of, of humans, humanoid robots to learn to coordinate with and against each other in soccer. Um, and all done in a physics simulator, these uh, robots have to deal with balance and coordination on a physical level. Um, so still inside of these tasks are um, those tricky, tricky problems of how to actually control a humanoid. And on top of that, trying to perform this high level difficult task of soccer. Um, so you know, I believe that still working in a simulator can be very useful for learning about humanoid control uh, since it offers a nice middle ground in terms of difficulty and realism and can hopefully let us make concrete progress on this, on this domain. So now with that groundwork laid, let me talk about reinforcement learning for a little bit, which will actually be a big focus for this talk. Um, so reinforcement learning is a very powerful tool uh, for learning to solve tasks. It just relies on trial and error 
uh, interactions with the environment. And just on that basic principle, uh, you can, in principle, solve many, many tasks. And this has been applied to humanoid control, and there have been some successes uh, in this domain. Um, but one critical uh, bottleneck for uh, doing RL for humanoid control is the reward function. Um, if you're not careful about specifying the reward, you can get very weird motions as at the output. So here's another well-known DeepMind video um, from their emergence of locomotion from a rich environments paper. So the reward is just move forward and uh, the robot just needs to clear this obstacle field. So in terms of leg motion, it learns very nice fluent uh, leg motion and it can run nice and smoothly. But everything at the hips and above is just a total mess. The arms are flailing around, the hips are rocking back and forth in a totally strange way. Um, it just does not look human-like. And this is just because the reward function doesn't care what's going on above the hips and only really cares about what's going on at the legs and below. Um, so, you know, this video uh, uh, from a paper a few years ago, we could see the leg motion is good, but everything aside from that is, is just a mess. Um, but even nice leg motion is not guaranteed. Um, it's well known that like the Majoko simulator uh, is not entirely like uh, accurate with respect to the real world. And so our policy can exploit um, flaws in the simulator. And we can sometimes run into these weird degenerate issues of um, the humanoid exploiting flaws in the simulator. This just does not look like an, a natural gate at all. Um, but this is what can happen if you use uh, too uninformative of a reward function. Uh, so one crucial part of this talk will be um, how can we actually learn motions in the simulated humanoids that resemble human motion. Um, and of course, the punchline uh, is fr from the title of the talk, um, but I'll delay that part a little bit longer. Um, let me first go into some software for this so that we have like a test bed to work with. So um, we work with this repository called DM Control. It's maintained by DeepMind and it's used to build continuous RL tasks. Um, and it uses the ever popular Mojoko simulator as its backend. Uh, so DM Control has a huge number of tasks uh, over many different domains, like cart pull, uh, the acrobat, fish, swimmer, snake, so many different um, so many different domains, so many different tasks. Um, but I'm not going to focus on any of them. Instead, I'm going to focus on this one domain, which is this humanoid. Uh, so it's a rather realistic looking humanoid. It has lots of joints, and it's designed to be average to a similar human body. Uh, so this should be a good proxy for studying humanoid control. And one other nice thing about DM control is it contains many, many tasks just for this humanoid right here. Um, I showed you the soccer task earlier, but there's also um, like vision-based tasks like navigating through this um, uh, gap field uh, using vision. Um, and the good news is uh, on top of this is that DM control provides tools to programmatically build new tasks. So if you're not satisfied with what DM control offers, they provide tools for you to build new ones. So it's um, conceptually an infinitely extensible uh, platform to work with. All right, so now let's go into um, what makes humanoid control difficult um, to try to really put in perspective um, why progress on this has been so difficult. So first, this is a high dimensional problem operating continuous dynamics and even worse, hybrid dynamics because of um, joint co or uh, contact with the ground and the feet. Um, so first of all, this is a very high dimensional 56 joints. This is a huge, cumbersome humanoid. And the observation space is ridiculously huge. It's equipped with a whole bunch of sensors, not just like joint angle and velocity measurements, but also uh, measures the state of the actuators, measures the touch sensors. It has accelerometers. Um, and then the action dimension itself, the action space it is also high dimensional, one action per joint. Um, and the action is a desired joint angles, um, which are sent to predefined PD controllers. So actually apply torques to track that uh, joint angle. So the crucial part of what makes humanoid control difficult is it's bipedal. Um, and in the presence of gravity, that means the humanoid can fall over and it can fall over very easily. Um, so to demonstrate this, um, here's a video of an attempted walking motion. So in gray is the motion we're trying to track. 
And in bronze is our humanoid attempting the motion. So at first, it does an OK job. But then in the middle, it doesn't quite make contact with the ground correctly. And then it starts to lean over. So the center of gravity gets too far forward. And then it's just game over. And it's incredibly easy to make the humanoid fall over. You need to like be ridiculously uh, coordinated to not fall over. Um, and on top of that, to make matters worse, uh, we don't want to just have our humanoid balance. We want it to do something useful, like walking in this video over here. But we want it to do what like humans could do. We want it to jump and dance and all those other sorts of things. And each of those motions requires a high level coordination. And it requires very, very different uh, kinds of motion. Like the, the, the joint coordination and, and motion and walking is very different than that corresponding jumping or doing cartwheels. So this is a highly multimodal problem. Um, so whatever policy or approach that we're going to use has to cope with this multimodality on top of the inherent difficulty of the task. All right, so now let's bring the title of the talk into this. Um, th there is good news in, in this, in this uh, scary domain. Um, we have mocap data. So, um, and we have lots of it, like hours of it. Um, so mocap data just consists of um, uh, recorded human motion. So we have this person over here running laps in this, uh, um, in this room and they have Vicon markers on them. And these Vicon markers just track where they are over time. Um, and so that can give us a pretty accurate way of uh, understanding what a running motion looks like. And then we can just retarget that into our simulator and DM control uh, has done this for us actually. So here we have the humanoid executing the same running motion as this person actually did over here. So the good news is we don't have to engineer a running motion. We have mocap data uh, do that for us. Um, so as I said, DM control comes equipped with some mocap data and it has three and a half hours of motion capture data over a huge diversity of behaviors. Um, so it has walking, uh, as you would expect. It has that running clip from before. It has more acrobatic maneuvers like cartwheels and even a little bit of salsa dancing. Um, so this is good. We have uh, some indication of what good human motion looks like, but it's not everything that we need. Um, so while mocap data shows what good motion is, it doesn't tell us how to achieve that motion. It only gives us kinematic information like joint angles, pose of the robot. It doesn't give us the sensor information. Um, recall that a humanoid has things like actuator states and uh, touch sensors. And more importantly, it doesn't give us the needed actions. Our needed actions are something like joint torques. Um, but the mocap data only tells us what the motion looks like. Um, so it's only a partial solution. It's not the full solution towards humanoid control. Um, now, there is a tool that can help us achieve, realize the mocap uh, motion, and that's reinforcement learning. Um, so that's the good news. But the bad news is RL is slow, and it's expensive. Um, and it gets incredibly expensive if you want to use RL to track like three and a half hours of mocap data, um, uh, like ridiculously expensive. And I'll convey that in a little uh, bit in this talk. Um, but this is where we come in. Um, our work addresses a shortcoming by releasing a data set um, of mocap data, but with a whole ton of extra information. And so with that, let's talk about our data set now. So our data set is called mocap act, which stands for motion capture with actions. Um, and it basically consists of these two pieces. First, it contains um, expert policies that can clap, uh, track individual uh, clip snippets. And then it can, and then from each of those experts, we generate many rollouts from those experts, which on top of the kinematic information from the mocap data contains all the proprioceptive observations that our humanoid robot is equipped with. And then the expert actions needed to realize the motion and a ton of extra information as well that could be useful for reinforcement learning, like value function estimates, advantage function estimates, and so on. All right. So now let me get into the individual pieces of mocap act, starting with the clip snippet experts. 
Um, so since we're doing reinforcement learning, we're going to need a reward function. Um, the DM control library contains actually a reward function for mocap tracking. Um, I won't go into the equation, but just the important pieces are that this incentivizes tracking the joint angles, poses the end effector, poses the robot body, uh, joint angles, robot velocity, all those sorts of things. So intuitively, if you can maximize this reward, you are going to track that mocap clip. And then what we do is for each snippet in our data set, we're going to train an expert policy, which is specialized to track that clip. And we do this using PPO. Um, we have a total of 2,589 snippets, which results in 2,589 policies. Uh, and this is a large amount of policies. Um, for each policy, we did like two to three days of training to like really make sure we can squeeze out all the performance we could. And if you do the math, this took us about 50 years of wall clock time to train all those policies. This is a crazy high number. This is something most labs cannot do. Um, and that number alone should like, indicate why most labs have not been able to like really make use of mocap data. Is because to like really make use of it, you have to like either do reinforcement learning or some other compute intensive approach. And this just doesn't scale for most for most people or most labs. Um, but we did we did the work, and um, now our data set uh, um, now with our data set release, uh, the community can take advantage of that. Um, so first, let me show that our experts are good. We don't want to release bad policies. Um, so I'll just let these videos um, um, uh, do the talking. So here's our walking clip. The motion very closely matches the mocap clip. Here's our jogging in circles. Our humanoid and the mocap clip basically look the same. It's also dancing. And then the more difficult maneuvers of cartwheeling and a jumping kick as well. All right, so I've demonstrated that we have a, a collection of very good policies. Um, but that's not the full story here. So um, while having like 2,589 expert policies is uh, always good to have, um, they are sort of cumbersome to work with. Like if you wanted to use them downstream for some other high level task, keeping around 2,589 policies at all times is probably not gonna work very well. Um, and uh, instead people like to work with data sets of just uh, um, a data that they can directly learn from. So that's what our mocap act release also consists of is expert rollouts um, on top of the expert policies. Um, but there's one important uh, question I want to bring up that uh, that's important in this domain. Um, how much data should we get from the expert? One is one rollout enough. Um, so as a motivation, imagine we're doing imitation learning where we get some demonstrations from the expert and we want to train a policy to replicate the motion of the expert. Nolan, to clarify, how long is for you our rollout? Sorry if you mentioned it already. Um, so it's we basically roll out for the length of the snippet. So the, the expert is going to be trained to track several seconds of motion. And so the rollout is going to be that same, uh, correspond to that same clip. OK, so, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So like those videos you saw before, that would be a rollout. Yeah, makes sense. OK. Um, so imagine we're doing imitation learning, and we just get one rollout from our experts. So um, we, we know what the motion looks like, we, and we have the observations and the actions needed to do it. So in concept, this should be uh, perfectly good for our, our learned policy. Um, but what happens when we try to learn roll out our learned policy? So for the first couple of time steps, we'll probably do OK. But then at some point, our learner will make a mistake, since it probably didn't learn from the data perfectly, or maybe there's some noise in the system. Now, um, recall that we're working with the bipedal robot in the presence of gravity and contact. So it's incredibly unbalanced and unstable. Um, and so what's going to happen is when we keep rolling out our learned policy, it's going to diverge very quickly. Uh, and so our learned policy is going to be very brittle and uh, probably um, won't be useful for control. Um, the good news, though, is that there's a pretty robust approach for this. 
um, and it's to do noisy rollouts, do many noisy rollouts. So what you do is you inject some Gaussian noise into our expert. And then when you do a rollout, you get this sort of noisy trajectory that looks like this. But the important thing is that uh, essentially the expert will be making small mistakes due to the noise. And then since it's trained to maximize the reward, it'll be able to correct those mistakes that it makes and pull it back itself back onto the trajectory to track. So you get a whole bunch of trajectories from your expert. And what essentially you get at the end of the day is this tube of trajectories around the nominal trajectory. And now you have this be your imitation data set, and then you train your policy on this. And as opposed to before, here's what will happen with our learned policy. So at some point it will like make a mistake or like take a worse than usual action. Um, but because it sort of lies in this tube, it will have seen a corrective action from the expert and so it'll be able to replicate, or more or less, the corrective action. And basically, if you have enough data, your learned policy will just sit in this tube. Um, and so uh, this this can actually get, um, sorry this can actually be useful for um, learning to control humanoid just from data, and so to allow the community to uh, take advantage of like these experts. We release two data sets of different size. One is going to be a smaller data set in case you don't have uh, much hard disk space to work with or um, internet restrictions. And so this will be 10 rollouts per expert at 50 gigabytes. And then if you want to squeeze out more performance and you have the space and bandwidth to do so, we release a 600 gigabyte data set um, at 100 rollouts per expert. Um, I will point out, broadly speaking, we get similar results with um, both data sets, but um, um, more data certainly doesn't hurt. Um, and probably by default, you should use the 600 gigabyte data if you can afford it. So I have a quick question. What's the idea behind uh, caching the data of, in rollouts? Is it expensive to roll out the experts in simulation or why not just distribute the experts and use Dagger for imitation? Um, okay, so like, as opposed to doing this offline approach, doing something more online and interactive, right? Yeah, or or just have the user generate using the expert policy. It's kind of a compressed version of the data set. It's the yeah. expert and the simulator. Yeah, um, that's a completely valid approach. And we released all the tools to generate the data. So people like, yeah, so first and foremost, people, if they want to, can implement that. Um, so I'll give um, two responses to this. Um, first, just releasing a data set like in and of itself is simpler. Um, the data set are just HDF5 files, so they're just something you can immediately load and, load and make use of, whereas doing something like Dagger just requires a bit more infrastructure and overhead. Um, so releasing a static data set is just more convenient in that regard. Um, and second, admittedly, the experts um, in a sense are trained for this offline rollout sort of scheme. Um, so for full context, the experts that we trained are like trained with some small amount of action noise injected into them, which basically means that the experts are trained to do well in this tube. Um, and typically what happens if you wanna run something like Dagger is your learned policy, you'll roll it out, it'll make a mistake and then it'll diverge. The problem is our experts are not going to do well outside of this tube. And what will happen with humanoid control is that when you make a mistake, like a fatal mistake, you're going to just diverge very quickly from this tube. So it, to be honest, I'm not sure our experts would be suitable for Dagger, or you'd have to do something a bit more involved than naive Dagger to, um, to contend with the fact that our experts are only going to be good in this tube. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think in practice, most people for Dagger, they do an annealing schedule where it starts out with only following the expert trajectory. Mm -hmm. And then you introduce an, a random uh, proportion of when you will select the from the actual policy that you're training. So at the beginning, it's just behavior cloning and it relaxes yep. towards the full Dagger thing. Um, that makes sense. Um, and like I said, there's, you could probably, um, um, with enough 
tweaking of dagger, like um, using the um, the roll in roll is it roll in roll out? Anyways, like switching control between the learner and the expert, you could probably get dagger to work. Um, the release of this data set is just one like economical way of making use of the experts. All right, any more questions? Okay, um, so let me also demonstrate that our experts do well under noise. And this should also sort of visualize what the um, data looks like, um, visually speaking. So for many of the rollouts, it looks almost the same as the original rollout without noise, which is entirely the point of the experts is that they want these experts should be able to cope with noise. And if it does so properly, you visually wouldn't be able to um, uh, see the impact of the noise. Now, this is not guaranteed 100% of the time. Sometimes the noise can trip up the expert and cause it to make a mistake. But vast majority of the time, the expert is able to um, reject uh, the, the injected noise in the system. So I'll quickly show a couple more. I think with the salsa dancing one, it does a good job. Whoops. Um, it's with more, I would say, highly dynamic motions that the expert can get tripped up. So there's one where it kind of falls over towards the end. But for the most part, our experts do a good job. I say as the humanoid falls over, I think here it should do good. All right. Um, so now let me go over how to actually use mocap act, because I want the community to be able to use this. I don't want to just talk about um, what we did for the paper. So first, we provide a link to the data set on our uh, github.io um, webpage, which itself you can find um, by visiting our paper on archive open review. When you click that link, you'll be directed to this page. Um, this is stored on Microsoft Research Open Data. Um, and you can see the um, you can see like the data set here, like the large rollout data set, the experts here, along with some other things we had done in the paper um, so that you can also uh, play with some of the applications we had done. Um, if you don't want to download the humongous data set, we also provide a Python script so you can download individual experts and rollouts. Um, which should be much faster to do than downloading from this website. Um, and I want to note that the experts are just stable baselines, uh, PyTorch policies, and the rollouts are stored in your standard HDF5 file. Um, actually, let me, as a demonstration, uh, show you how this would work. So for downloading an expert, for instance, um, you would call something like this. This is provided on like our website and our GitHub page. So don't worry about um, digesting all the information here. I just want to show what the workflow would sort of look like. So from the command line, it would just download our expert. And in here is basically the PyTorch information, uh, which is loaded by stable baselines. And then if we were to run this policy, which is also provided on our website, you would get something like this. And then if you were to download the data set, um, let's download um, the small version of some subset of the data. You would similarly just get this sort of list of files that are being downloaded. And these are being downloaded pretty quickly. I think this data set should take about a minute. Um, but anyways, let me get back to the slide while, uh, while it does that. Um, all right. It's, Admittedly, like we're running at 40 minutes, um, I can go into the applications of the paper if you would like. Um, I guess this may run over time. What is? How does everyone feel about that? Sure, we are not we are not that constrained. So sure. Okay, sounds good. Um, so to um, sort of demonstrate, like one way you use is would use this data set. Um, let's try to use mocap act to train a policy that can track many mocap clips. So recall that um, earlier in the slide deck we had um, snippet experts. So for each snippet, you would train one policy that's specialized um, for that clip, um, which you can do it, but it'll be inefficient. So can we get away with having a single policy that can track many clips, maybe even all the clips in um, our mocap data set? And 
The good news is that you can do that using MOCAP ACT. So MOCAP ACT consists of observations and actions. So this is a valid imitation learning data set. And if you do supervised learning, you can get a uh, policy that can track many different clips. Um, now it has this sort of interesting looking architecture. So let me try to break this down. So our policy uses an encoder decoder scheme. And what will happen is for the encoder, it will sort of look at this um, small window in the future from the mocap clip corresponding to the desired motion. So we can see here, it's sort of like a walking motion. And what it will do is it will take that um, uh, reference in mocap clip and output a skill embedding, um, which sort of in, in a neural network way tries to say things like walk forward, or turn, jump, so on and so forth. So it's supposed to be a summary of what the mocap clip is conveying. And then the decoder will take that skill from the encoder along with the state from uh, the environment and output the desired action. Um, now, I wanna, one thing I wanna emphasize here is um, we can train this policy really fast. So training the snip, snippet experts via RL took 50 years, as I mentioned before, but using the simple supervisory technique on a single machine with a single GPU takes only three hours um, and we to the point that we can achieve 84% of the expert's performance. So I can't match it, but we can get close to it. Um, and I let me demonstrate that with some videos. So we have walking motion here done pretty reliably. We have sidestepping here done pretty well. Um, now, admittedly, our expert multi-clip Sorry, our multi-clip policy is not perfect. Um, as I said, it only shoots 84% of the performance. And on some clips, it doesn't do terribly well, particularly those that involve dynamic motions, like for cartwheel. It will kind of halfway get there, but then make a mistake and fall over. And then for jogging, it will similarly uh, make a mistake where like the foot hits the ground improperly and it'll sort of trip and fall. Um, so there's definitely room for improvement, um, but in the span of three hours, we can get this level of performance, which is impressive. Um, one thing that uh, this uh, multi-clip policy is really useful for is for reusing it for reinforcement learning. Um, so to back up, typically in RL, we do exploration in the low-level action space, since that's the um, space we care about. Um, but applying this humanoid control just won't work well because it, the humanoid is just going to flail around, probably fall over, and it'll take forever to learn anything useful. Um, but let's look at this policy architecture that we have here. Um, because of the hierarchy and the fact that we have in the middle this um, learned skill in ZT here, what we can do is throw away the encoder, keep the decoder, and basically merge that with our humanoid environment, call that a new RL environment. And now look, we can do reinforcement learning in this space here. And now instead of doing exploration over low level actions, we do exploration over skills. So rather than applying Gaussian noise to these actions, we just randomly choose skills like walking, jumping, so on and so forth, which results in much more coherent exploration. And as we'll see, much better results at the end. So um, as a rapid fire demonstration of this, um, consider a go to target uh, task. So the humanoid needs to go to some target. Um, but this is a sparse reward task. So you get a reward of plus one for being at the target and zero otherwise. And worse yet, the target will teleport to some other location once you're standing on it. So you need to sort of track this moving target. So this is a very hard exploration problem. You don't get much reward signal here. Uh, so you have to think very carefully about how to do exploration. But the good news is that if you reuse this low-level policy, the exploration happens at the skill level. And you can actually solve this task very reliably, just like in a couple of days, like with 100 million interactions, and get very nice looking motion like this. So notice that it's doing realistic humanoid motions. It's running around. It's turning. It's maintaining speed. And then it's also reactive. So rather than losing balance, it'll sort of sidestep, regain balance, and then resume its motion. And it's able to very reliably solve this uh, go to target task and make it look very easy in the process. Now, as a counterpart, if you don't use a low-level policy and you just do exploration in the action space, 
you'll get something like this. So this doesn't solve the task. Maybe it gets to the first target, but it'll just immediately fall over. And the motion looks incredibly strange. This looks like something out of the thing or dead space. Um, and this would probably take many, many days to actually solve, but the motion would just look very messy. Um, whereas using this low level policy lets you solve the task faster and gives you good looking motion in the process. All right, um, so to sort of bootstrap our discussion, uh, I wanted to briefly go over research directions um, or sort of ideas I have. There's many more uh, avenues you could take this down. So first recall that um, in the multi-clip policy videos, uh, it could do some skills well, but not others. Um, so how do we properly train the policy so that it can sort of uniformly cover all those skills? Uh, so for some insight into this, many of the clips just involve locomotion. Um, because we as humans just do locomotion all the time. So that means locomotive skills are overrepresented in the data set compared to other skills like um, uh, cartwheels or um, um, acrobatics. So how do we properly um, rebalance the data set or do some other thing so that we can do well in everything? Um, more broadly, um, can we apply this data set for offline reinforcement learning? So the promise of offline RL is that it can take huge unstructured data of like a robot doing all sorts of random things and uh, learn something direct uh, immediately useful for it from some other task. So can that be applied to um, humanoid control? So can we use all these demonstrated emotions to immediately learn a policy that can be used, that can solve or do good at some task, like maybe controllable steering or some sort of navigation? Um, finally, let me... Uh, uh, Acknowledge my collaborators at Microsoft who helped me a lot with this project. Um, couldn't have done it without them. Um, and with that, thank you all for your attention. I'll answer any questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan, for the great talk. And congrats for the paper being accepted. I believe it's a very useful data. So, yeah, thank you. No, no, yeah. so now it's the QA section. Are there any questions from the audience? Please just unmute yourself and answer. Uh, sorry, ask you a question. Um, actually, one last thing I want to point oh. out. Um, I, I, I just realized um, I wanted to give like one last demo for this, but this can just sort of run in the background while we uh, discuss. So first off, let me quickly just sort of, whoops. I wish I had a GUI of this working. Um, but I'll just very quickly show you what this data set looks like. Um, of course, read our paper to get more details on this. Ah. So our data set basically um, contains rollouts for a clip. Ah, well, anyways, I think uh, we're running short on time, so I won't do that. But one thing I will do um, is I want to take advantage of that data set I downloaded and just train a multi-clip policy just to, for a quick demo here. So there's this huge nasty Python command here, but the important thing is that it will just run a supervised learning scheme. So it will just immediately consume the data set. And we can already see the mean squared error, for instance, dropping to around 0 0.04, and this will just keep dropping over time. Um, and hopefully at the end of the q and I can show you a decently good uh, walking policy. All right, and so with that, let's, uh, let's, let's begin the discussion. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, any questions from the audience? <laughs> yeah, I have a quick question. So, hey, Nolan, uh, this is Kevin speaking. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I, I'm interested in this research area because I, I got my start uh, in research doing RL for character animation, hmm. specifically humanoids um, in the graphics community. I'm not sure if you're aware of the work from M Michael van der Pan's lab, like Jason Pang. Uh, Pang, yes. Um... Long. So a lot of the things you're showing, I mean, I mean, it's very good that you uh, present a public data set for people to use, but a lot of these things are things that have been solved in the sort of RL slash graphics community side of things yes. um, by papers by Jason Pang. I'm just curious, 
what your views are on that line of work and what you think might be missing there that uh, you hope this data set will enable other researchers to kind of uh, actively work on. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, full acknowledgement. Um, we basically use the same tools and replicate a lot of what um, uh, works that like uh, Jason Peng did and many others. Um, like DeepMind also did some work on this. Yeah, Nicholas um, Hees and Iwatasa. Yeah. Yes. Um, one key uh, contribution of our work, though, is the scale of the data set. So Jason Pank, for instance, with his Deep Mimic paper, um, he did release some policies, but they're only like a few minutes worth. Um, and many other works have similarly like released policies, but it's like on the scale of minutes of mm -hmm. um, experts. Whereas we did hours, like three and a half hours. Yeah, um, sure. I'm, I'm not disputing that. I, I think it's very useful for this data set to be public. I'm just saying, um, wh like, what do you hope the next steps will be that will be enabled by kind of releasing this data set? Like, what are some directions you're, you're kind of hoping to see uh, people push on? Yeah. Um, long and short of it is that we hope that our data set release will lower the barrier for people to do research in humanoid control. Um, consider the fact that if you want to do humanoid control, you basically need to learn what walking looks like, what running looks like, so on and so forth. And if you were doing this like um, as of a few months ago, you would have had to learn those sort of motions yourself, like in Majoko, like running reinforcement learning. This is incredibly tedious and expensive, and you basically have to reinvent the wheel um, so this sort of disincentivizes people from working on this. Um, and this is sort of uninteresting and tedious. So first and foremost, our work removes that tedium and sort of levels a playing field for everyone. Now, like we sort of hopefully establish a baseline of what good motion looks like on this humanoid. And so, um, hopefully this establishes a common, um, um, starting point for people that want to work on humanoid control um to immediately just learn good useful motion or like use this data set for learning good useful motion and focus on the real interesting problems of humanoid control like you know the soccer task i showed you earlier but like all sorts of other things like doing vision based um control or maybe multi-humanoid uh, uh tasks this is what we should be studying we shouldn't have to be relearning what good motion looks like when we're starting our paper Yeah, and if I can add a quick follow-up, that's a great answer. Um, I, I was curious, what do you think about Mojoko as a simulation platform for this? Do you think it's sufficient to uh, simulate some of the more intricate behavior you're describing, such as manipulation sort of uh, tasks? I know there was that DeepMind one where they were moving the boxes, but mm -hmm. I've heard from people that, and you showed previously, you know, that Mojoko has sort of inaccuracies in the simulator that might uh, be problematic um, as we move to domains where we don't have mocap for, for this sort of tasks? Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, though I will say, um, I mean, we have mocap data for lots of things. So the, the, the upside of using mocap data is it would sort of prevent those weird like physics artifacts that you were seeing earlier. Um, like when the humanoid was just walking around that weird way, that's because it didn't know ahead of time what good motion looked like. It was just maximizing the forward velocity and that odd motion was what came out. Um, the, the one other like upside of using mocap data is it will sort of iron out the weird like physical simulator issues because it will force your humanoid to only learn motion that looks realistic. Um, now I don't, necessarily think that will immediately get you to do like sim to real transfer uh you still have to deal with um the issues of doing sim to real transfer if you want to apply this to humanoid robots um but i do think that using a simulator like Mujoko in combination with mocap data should produce sufficiently realistic motion that you shouldn't have to worry about um physics artifacts like you would um normally see um uh if you're just maximizing reward naively Did that answer your question? 
Yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm also curious if you've had any personal experience with trying to look at using Madroco for sort of manipulation, uh, humanoid manipulation tasks, like um, moving blocks or, or sort of in hand, mm -hmm. having a stick or something. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, that sort of thing. Right. Um, I personally have not. Um, deep, the DM control does come equipped with manipulation tasks. So this, like, it is being studied. You mentioned um, that DMine has, like, released some cool looking videos on that. Um, so I, I cannot I cannot speak to any personal experience on that, unfortunately, though. I have also a question. What are your thoughts? I, I've seen some people looking into this uh, of using uh, a good po human pose estimation with some sort of YouTube videos. Have you considered this? Because, because it seems more on the coding effort, but lower in data generation effort. Is, is the data just not good enough for, for what you would want to have for an expert policy? Um, I haven't looked into that myself, though. I've, I'm, I, I'm aware that there's been some work on that. Um, I think that is a promising avenue, though. Uh, getting mocap data is, of course, expensive. Um, and um, it has like its own sort of issues, potentially. Like, there can be like weird recording artifacts. Um, whereas with video, um, it's widely available and it still contains a lot of the structure and you don't need like an expensive mocap uh, setup to do so. Um, I think if we can get good like mocap data, so to speak, from videos, I think this will um, this will just only, only make things better for humanoid control. Um, I haven't not looked into that personally, though. So it's the problem from the like the accuracy of uh, off the shelf post estimator. Like if if we can estimate very accurate uh, human posts from like YouTube videos, then it will be very useful. Is is this the problem, the issue? Um, I certainly know it's still an active research area. Like there's only um, there the people are still publishing papers on it. Um, yeah, yeah. At this point, so I have to assume it's not fully solved yet, um, but I haven't not personally looked into that area, so I cannot um, give specifics. No, I think what you say is spot on. It's definitely not as good as Mocha, uh, like nowhere. But uh, I, yeah, I guess the interesting that, question, right? yeah, exactly. The interesting question is more like, is it maybe good enough for uh, for other things? But yeah, like mo having mocap da data is cool because then you don't have to worry at least about this one thing. I have a, another question uh, regarding this uh, GPT training. So I think you have oh, like you both the uh, uh, log probability loss and the MSC loss. Oh, no, I actually haven't looked at the paper very detailed, but just the slide you presented. So. Uh, in uh, so like in NLP, people train GPT over uh, this great uh, tokens, right? And they use some uh, 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 logs of max laws to train the model. And yeah. here, do you also like tokenize the actions or tokenize the steers to uh, enable this kind of training? Or if you just train them in continuous uh, control space uh, using MSC logs? Or, uh, uh, the the latter. Latter. Uh, let's see. So can we, can we go back to the slide that you show the pipeline of the GPT? Uh, it's, I don't uh, have that on here. I guess it's just uh, uh, maybe re, uh, 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 there's a multi clip policy training uh, 14, I guess, 14. Yeah. Right. So, so my question is basically, uh, is this, uh, so the ZT, the skill embedding is some features, continuous, uh, real valued features, or if it's some uh, uh, discrete variables or something. Uh, sure. So the ZT here is continuous and it's basically uh, encodes a Gaussian distribution. Um, I, see. Oh, I, see. I do so want to like, yeah, I do want to briefly mention that this is, 
distinct from the uh, GPT work we did um, uh -huh. also in the paper. Nice. So just make oh. sure there's no confusion. I see, I see. So the AT is just the, that you can, can be directly input to the uh, controller to simulate the actions, uh, the, the motion of the humanoid, right? The, yeah. The, oh, okay, I see. that makes sense. Um, so let's, um, let me take advantage of this now to like see how our um, policy is doing. So this has been training for like the past 10 minutes. So let's see what we can get out of it. All right, so this is running the policy I've just been training for the past 10 minutes. So immediately we can see that it can do things like walking. Um, let me see if it can handle this clip. Um, obviously some clips it'll be able to do better than others. So that walking clip, it seems to do good. Although you can see it sort of uh, uh, struggle a little bit at the end. I think this is one clip where it won't do terribly good. OK, yeah, this one uh, will kind of trip up and fall. So our, again, our policy is not perfect, um, but in just 10 minutes, it can learn reasonably good walking motions. Um, and it only gets better when you add more data, of course, um, and give it a little bit longer to train. So um, you know, in about 10 minutes, you can already like get a useful policy for doing reinforcement learning on. So I hope this like really indicates that this data is not is uh, a big step forward in terms of getting people and lowering the barrier into working on humanoid control. Um, all right, any more questions or comments? So uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, that's thanks Nola again for this great presentation. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Oh, and thanks so much. Yeah, it's been super cool. It's been, been great having you. Thank you.